welcome once again, and we have Maurice Boland with us, and he's in fine fettle. In fact, all this week, every time I've phoned him, he's been eating and drinking in some really posh Marbella places. Is that true, Maurice? Well, the point about it is, um, I my dear wife is away this week, so I um, I don't cook. I don't know anything about cooking, uh, nothing at all. Boiling a kettle is fine. I once remember many years ago when my dear wife was away on holiday with her brother and sister, I remember reading about boiling an egg in the microwave. So I thought I would do that. I put an egg into the microwave and put it on for five minutes. With that, it exploded. And to such an extent that I had to get rid of the microwave. You couldn't clean it. There was an egg everywhere. Sure. So then I... Um, then I was told to put it in a, in, a, in a cup of water, which I did. I bought a new microwave. It had exploded. And someone said to me, did you put a pinhole in it? I said, for God's sake, I'm going out for breakfast. I'll speak to you later. So that was one attempt. The other attempt was a pizza in the oven. I never realized that a pizza could be burned so black that it becomes unrecognizable. Mm. So that was uh, my attempt in cooking. So I do go out a lot. I like to eat uh, good food, and I've just come back from a beautiful dinner where we had the lunch, where we had paella, baccaroni, and a nice cheesecake, which has made its way onto my Facebook just now because I run a tiny little competition now and again that people seem to enjoy. Guess where I'm eating? Which reminds me of a little story I'd like to share with you. I did. A, I was asked to do um, age concern, um, a Christmas lunch. Would I? Would I? Um, what I, what you call it, paper, whatever, sponsor it. And I said, yes, the radio station. I said, yes, of course we would. And they said, would you make an appearance? And I said, well, would they know who I am even. So they said, well, come on, you pay for it, come and make an appearance. So Christmas lunch was ready in our house, but I had to fly down to a place called Ice and Estepona. I don't know if you know it, maybe you've been there a few times. And um, I walked in and there was quite a big chair. Barry Hands, I remember, introduced me and he said, this is the man who sponsored the thing. There was a woman in the wheelchair, absolutely going berserk, clapping and you'd think Cliff Richard had walked in, clapping and roaring. So I was really fascinated by this. And I walked over and I said, tell me, dear, do you know who I am? And she said, no, my dear, but if you ask Matron, she'll tell you. <laughs> oh, boom, boom. Yeah, they all wanted the better ones. Um, Maurice. Um, we're going to think of UK in a number of ways. And mm. it's not all sweetness and light at the moment because there were headlines in newspapers last week saying dirty Britain. Because, of course, Britons tend to play with the straight bat, cricket and all that. But they're just as guilty as many nations setting up overseas tax havens. And there's lots in the um, East Atlantic there and nobody bothers until recently when Tony Blair and his uh, lady uh, were accused of hiding things and not paying tax on um, half a million pounds and three million pounds, etc. So we're a bit of a hypocritical nation, are we? Well, first of all, I'm Irish, so you can't include me as are we. I think uh, where, where Boris, our dear Boris, was staying just I swear by car from here five minutes on his uh, little jaunt to Marbella, or should I say Ben Havis? Well, yes, was I was the... waving to Boris. He's just over the hill, as we see from the back of my um, generated picture. Well, actually, that is what I'm looking at at the moment. And was he was there. Time? I was yeah. waving to him. Didn't wave back. Well, anyway, so he was staying, of course, in um, what do you call its house? Um, um, Zach Goldsmith, the Goldwater Goldsmith's house. And uh, that's uh, that they say is another tax haven or tax avoidance place. They're saying that. But honestly, it's a subject that I'm not too versed on as a taxpayer, uh, as a person who has no, no um, choice. Uh, no, but, but do, do you hold it against these people that can come up with schemes like this? They may be no. legal, but are they moral? No, I don't. To be honest with you, um, if uh, I think that the tax people, on the other hand, are brutal, are absolutely brutal. I'll give you an example. Um, I'm Part of my work is in real estate, as you possibly know. I, I'm an independent. I'm working with Bromley Estates. Now, the only expenses I have that can go through legal expenses 
or petrol or diesel, telephone. Um, that's about all I can get away with. Going back to 2016, four years, which they're allowed to go back to the tax people, they removed 5,000 euros from my bank. Just removed it, took it. Mm. Um, we tried to got the accountants to find out what this is all about. And it's because they didn't accept my petrol expenses. So we sent them a list. Thank goodness the office happened of every tour I did that year, 2016, and the name of the people and where they were. And yet they still didn't accept it. They kept the 5,000. That's brutal. So if I could find a way of getting back at them by telling me, <laughs> telling them I can invest in heart insurance, I'd do it. Well, uh, yeah, that's a very wise investment. No, you're right. I, they don't take prisoners, the um, Spanish uh, IRS, neither do the don't. IRS in America. And they've started going very, very tough in Britain as well. Mm, okay. Things are yeah, but it's not, look, it's a no win situation, trust me, and you know that yourself. You, you, no matter what, you, you stand up against the tax people. But, that what they do is they, they take the money and say, come after us, and uh, you don't have any chance. Uh, I also have a, a very big problem at the moment with a bank that I'm with. Uh, wonder should I name them? Yes, I think I will. Deutsche Bank. Hmm. Deutsche Bank, two weeks ago, I was out having a uh, you know, with clients. I took my phone out where my cards are in, put it to the machine, and the machine rejected my card. So it says on the on my card, so please do not use this card. It's now being blocked. Uh, words that I think. I'm totally confused and embarrassed. So the next day I got the accounts again to speak to Deutsche Bank to ask what's going on. They said that they had um requested certain papers. I've been with them for eight years now. Certain papers, tax returns, etc., or they would go and freeze my account. Uh, so uh, my accountant sent them the papers. But unfortunately, the papers came to me. The accountants sort of misunderstood and sent the papers to me so I could send them to my, as me, Morris, they'd written them in Spanish. As I'm not so fluendo at the lingo, and I, I, but I didn't see this thing and it, it was lying in my outbox, inbox, whatever box. So I didn't send them anything. And that's where they froze my account. So I went and spoke to the, the you know, what, what you speak to, by the way, when you speak to a bank nowadays, is you speak to a tap or a wall or a walnut or a, or a painting or a light or a tree, but not to a human. And every human you can speak to in the bank, they said, well, we'll inquire into it. So anyway, I spoke to what's called your, meant to be your, your account manager. That's a new thing now. Instead of having a manager, people are assigned to account manager. I said, what's going on here? And he told me he didn't get the papers. And I said, fine. I said, do you mind asking, if I ask, why didn't you write to me in English? And he said to me, well, are you as an English account? And I said, hmm, have a look at my passport and tell me what part of it in my passport that says Chinese. A stupid question to ask me, it's an English account. Why it's the way, Maurice, that they get out of doing what they should do. Don't why didn't, I said to him, why didn't you phone me that week and hmm. say, please, Mr. Bone, make sure the papers get in and we're gonna to have to freeze your account. Well, this is a German no bank, of course, but I'm making no apologies for that because the Spanish banks are just as bad. Uh, one or two of them are in trouble, I have been informed, and there are going to be more and more mergers. Well, but let me just add to this, please. Uh, read Dutch Bank. My parting words to them on Friday when I stormed out of the bank were, please get Donald Trump to pay back his money so you guys aren't struggling and you leave me alone. <laughs> Listen, you bring Donald Trump for everything. Stop it. Uh, he's people now are... He's disgusting. <laughs> he's impossible. Now, uh, first of all, let me just quickly add a, a big congratulations to Peterborough United Football. I'm not a football fan, not a football fan, uh, but um, Dara McAntony is a friend of mine, Austin's father. <coughs> they used to live in Marbella, McAntony, and he lives, he bought Peterborough at a very young age. He's a very successful multimillionaire. And they won against Queen Parks, Rangers, whatever today. 
So well done to them. Now, I have is something that, else. That's it. You've got that off your chest, have you now? Yeah. Now, another thing I want to get off my chest. Some time ago, I wrote an article about an idea that I had against anti-vaxxers. And the article went something like this. I believe that all anti-vaxxers should get four weeks, one month warning that if they don't get the vaccine, they're going to go into lockdown for eight weeks. Lots of them, of course, will immediately get the vaccine. But those that aren't, they'll go into lockdown. Now, the reason I'm saying this for eight weeks is now we can make a survey over those eight weeks because everybody in the streets will be vaccinated. And we'll see how many hospitalizations and how many illnesses and how many deaths. So after eight weeks, we'll analyze it and say, well, hold on, we've had no deaths. We have no deaths. We've had uh, very few of those in hospital. So it means that you anti-vaxxers are costing us billions and time when people like cancer patients or, or emergency cases, you're blocking the intensive care units. And today I read in the papers, this is exactly what Austria are thinking of doing. Well, there the we are, another Germanic um, speaking country. Uh, let me tell you something that has just been uh, put on our news desk this very day about the vaccines, because the figures don't add up. They're very low at the moment in Spain, especially where we are in Andalusia. It's yep. great. And you look at Britain, who are supposed to be way ahead in the number of vaccines, and it's going mad. It's over 40,000 a day, and they're fearing 100,000 a day. And yeah. people are saying, well, why? Well, well OK, I'll is, answer. I'll answer. Well, Give me the percentage of people that are vaccinated in Great Britain. Percentage-wise, it yeah. depends what, what, what stage they're at, Maurice. Well, let's, 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 say, let's say, OK, let's say 60%. Oh, no, it's a lot more than that. OK, let's, let's say it's 80%. Yes, nearer the okay. truth. Yeah. So tell me, how many people live in England? Uh, well, there's about 65 million that we know about. There's plenty more so that what's we know. what's 20 percent per cow out? Well, you're giving me the maths thing now. Yeah, I know it's several millions, but yeah, well, more than seven million. And that's well, what's it, it, it's all depending on the math, of course, as the Americans would say. Uh, but it's still proportionately. Uh, vax wise we shouldn't be anywhere near that i'll tell you what's sneaking out now is the problem they've discovered is li lying with the 12 to 15 year olds uh that don't need it yeah. and they're spreading oh, it like oh, mad oh, in where, school where, 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 did you, where did you hear this book Rob, uh, this nonsense 12 no, to 15 years don't, don't need it most of the hospitals are now filled filled well, with the younger ones. i'm agreeing with you they that the authorities don't think they need it but you and i know that they need it. Okay, hands on the table, a cards on the table. It would say the authorities. We're talking about Boris and his crew. In July, <laughs> when July, Boris has decided it's more or less all over. You can go out now. You don't need masks. You don't need social distancing. Forty to sixty thousand. I can go to football matches, and they did. And what happened? Tell me what it's like today. Worst in Europe. Is that a result? Um, and yet he stands up. Yet he stands up and he says, you can wear your mask if you want to. You don't need to if you don't want to. It's up to you. Well, you've got to look at Sweden, you see. They've been very light. Why, Why do you have to look at Sweden? They've got away with it, Maurice. They're doing very well. But forget Sweden, forget France, forget Germany, forget China. Just talk England. It's not doing very well. Well, we're looking for reasons why. And one of the things that we know between us... Anti-vaxxers. Well, they are a lot of people, but they're not very obedient anti-vaxxers. We do our own thing. We're like uh, the rednecks in America. There's a lot of people in America that won't have it because it, they say, there's goes a, yeah, against sorry, their a, freedom of choice. Yeah, it's their name for these people in America. They're called Trumpets. <laughs> Listen, who do you hate more? Is it Boris or the Donald? The Donald out of 10 gets 11 and Boris out of 10 gets four. <laughs> so you've there's changed huge, completely. You love, huge, you love, I know why you love uh, Donald, because you've seen what Biden gets up to. 
Biden's got nothing to do with the lies that Trump is coming. Do you know that Trump was on Fox News a couple of weeks ago? And these are the words that came out of his mouth, not my mouth. COVID was all but over when I left the White House. Morris, that's a politician. Look at reality. Look at you Joe Biden. Excuse? Come on, they're hiding the truth. He's not what? fit for purpose. He falls over up steps. He trips over carpets. He can't even put two or three words together. Who are you talking about now? Joe, Uncle Joe Biden. Okay, let's get to that. He can't, I'm no fan of his, and I think he's the wrong man, the wrong job. But tripping over words, he's a very clever politician. Clip, tripping over words is because he was born with an impediment, a speech impediment. Oh, it's not that oh, honest oh. You've been brainwashed, so, Boris. You've been brainwashed. That's by who? By, by who? The, by the media. The media in America is listen. appalling. Are you now going on about this rubbish? Have you ever heard, have you ever heard about vote rigging up until the trumpet came along. I mean, 2016, he accused everyone, you know, he's just before he was with, uh, what's her name, Clinton. Everyone vote, that's, that's, that, that's, uh, vote, that's not vote rigging, sorry, that's uh, news, what you call it, um, false news. Fake that's news, false yeah. news. Yeah, that's false news. Fake news, fake news, everything's fake news. Donald, is there anything that disagrees with you that isn't fake news? No, that's fake news in itself. No, fake news. It's all fake news. If you agree with me, <laughs> that's okay. Do you know that people are rejecting? Do you know this? This is Donald speaking. I'm about as orange as he is today. Do you know that people who are rejecting the vaccine are doing it because they don't trust Biden? Wow. Listen, I'm very surprised at you. In fact, you're shocking me now because you're the greatest self-promoter in the whole of Spain, probably <laughs> half the right. world. Yeah, and that's who, very nice. Who's that's your competition? You. I'll tell you who's your competition. It's the Donald. I would have thought you would support him to the hilt. I supported Donald for the first two years, two and a half years. I thought maybe this is something different, maybe putting a businessman in there. I thought it was a good idea. All of a sudden, along came COVID. It makes a man. It'll make a president. And he denied. Do you know, I account that he accounts for a lot of deaths in, in America. He came up with such rubbish. Don't worry, it'll all be over in a couple of ooh, a couple of weeks. It'll all be over. And take sexy, clacky, clacky, chlorine. Just take a few of those. They'll be all <laughs> over. I'm fine. I'm fine. Everything will be fine. Don't worry about that. It's all cool. And uh, there you are. And the question I want to ask about Afghanistan, in 2020, Donald Trump had a meeting with the uh, Taliban against all his advisors. He had this meeting with Taliban. February, listen to what I'm saying, February 2020. February 2020. So that gave him seven months in office more. OK, so why didn't he do the withdrawal? Well, uh, the Donald does things a different way. You've got to look at North Korea to see things like that. But it works. Don't compare Donald to, to Joe uh, as hold regards on, on, Afghanistan. He's made a complete mess of it. Even the left wing liberal. Press Joe, excuse me. Joe down. Biden had the exact same time, seven months. But with a big difference, Trump had taken out 16,000 troops and said, there you are, we'll leave you with three of them, you deal with them. Morris, we have a situation here of wheeling and dealing with people that are not always honourable. So therefore, maybe the politicians okay. are not always honourable and do things Donald their own Willen. way. But when, since when did you start trusting politicians? I'm, I don't know. Donald will end up in prison, that's for sure. So look, let's just see some of the news here, what's happening here. Um, that I put, I wrote some stuff here, but I, where was it here that I saw? Oh yeah, that was a terrible thing, this Alec Baldwin thing, just to get onto, I was going to say a lighter side, but it was you know, the tragic side of Alec Baldwin. Do you know who Alec is? I don't know. There, you live in Portugal. Do you know who Alec Baldwin is? Oh, absolutely. I mean, he's good at firing guns, apparently. Well, Alec Baldwin was handed a gun on his new movie as a, you know, he's a cowboy movie, and he fired it and, and killed the woman with it. He, he, was, he, was, he handed a stage gun. Well, sorry, he thought it was a stage. Who would hand an actor a gun with a bullet? 
Uh, well, it's happened before a few years ago, and we never got to the bottom of that. Uh, th there is a problem here that the stage guns uh, are in actual fact weapons that they take little bits out um, so that it looks very real because it is real. But yeah. as you quite rightly asked, who's put the real bullet in there? Or well, should now, we now, say water pistols from now on? Well, now this is now boiled down to the assistant director who handed Baldwin the, the gun. It's got to that point at the moment. Because, you know, I, I don't know, you know, I think it's a tragic thing that they can't charge with anything. How do they can charge with something? Um, but, you know, it's like almost being a passenger in a car that kills someone. Nothing to do with you. You just happen to be in the car. You just happen to have been handed a gun with a bullet in it, mm -hmm. which is not meant to have a bullet in it. Um, now, let me tell you, as we sort of get close to the end of this, as the night begins to fall in here on Marbella, the, I nearly was killed. People don't know this publicly, but I was nearly killed two days, three days ago. Do you want to hear the story how I yes. nearly died? And it's a warning to other people, especially to you. I had a faruka, or I think that's the name of it, on my foot. Do you know what a faruka is? Yeah. And it's, it's a virus, believe it or not. Mm. So, so I went to the Rio clinic where I met a doctor who then said, um, I'm going to use a scalpel. I said, well, you're going to cut my foot off. I said, no, 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 they, you know, they scrape it. It was quite sore. And then he had a wonderful statement. He said, this might, pain, this might be painful, the next thing I'm going to do. And he puts like an acid that burns into it. Oh, my God. But then it was a she doctor, a woman doctor, I should say. It was a very sexist she doctor. And then they, she put a, a bandage on it. And she said, do not get that wet for three days. There's nothing wrong with that. So I went home and the next my, my wife told me to put a plastic bag on it when you take a shower and seal the damn bag, which I did on the foot. So I put a plastic bag on it, it's a freezer bag actually, and I put some tape, the black tape, you know, it's electrical tape, sticky tape, mm. and it sealed it really well. So I thought, no, I had a better idea. I'm gonna take the bin from my bedroom, plastic bin, and turn it upside down, and I'll even put my foot in that. So I won't have to, you know, think. Well, there did, was did you shower. film? Did you film this? What, my me naked. I'm trying. I'm, I'm, I'm so, trying. So, I'm, so, I'm visiting you in that state with a bucket. Yeah, Carry with on. a bucket. So anyway, I, I uh, it all went well, uh, and I uh, showered, uh, and I bent down to put the uh, shampoo down or something, and the next minute the stool went wandering. And I went, I didn't just fall, I went up first and then crashed down on my back. And I lay there for a moment, so I haven't got a great back. And I thought, this, well, first of all, this is for sure damage. I hit that bottom of that bath, a thump. And I thought something has to be broken. When I looked up, I saw the tap, which juts out of the wall, a hair's breadth from my head. So if I'd been back just that one centimeter, that would have hit the soft part of the back of my skull. And I wouldn't be with you today, either dead or brain damaged or something. And my son put me at ease and he said, Dad, we would have found you in 10 days. <laughs> I can just see the headlines, Morris. Bowling <laughs> kicks the bucket. Brilliant, that. Brilliant, that. <laughs> tap, tap on the brain. What is it? Water on the brain. Well, water on the brain. Tap on the head cures it. So Listen, anyway, I'm going my... to swing away from this. Charming okay. story. Just one thing I want to just one thing I want to share with our people here, uh, which I read last night. Marbella has made it into the nomination list for the European Best Destination 2022, and Prestige Award comes with a multi-million euro advertising prize. If Marbella wins, it will be featured in a global media campaign free of charge, which features in Forbes magazine across Yahoo, Women's Magazine, Marie Clara. The winning destination will benefit from advertising campaign estimates in the value of 10 million. Well done, Marbella. Well, there you go. Yes. Um, and um, a lot of people criticize Marbella. It's not what it used to be. Well, it isn't in certain things. Other things are better. Some things young are, people, are young worse. people think it's great. People your age, they don't appreciate it. Of course, I still hang around. <laughs> <Port of Belusen. laughs> no comment. I rest my case. In the following, uh, I'm going to um, mention um, 
basically a, a problem that we have in the United Kingdom about mm -hmm. our uh, nation states, uh, principalities, uh, other kingdoms that have been set up like Northern Ireland, to a lesser extent, what one must say, like Wales and like Scotland. My goodness me, Wales and Scotland are kicking off and causing trouble. Of course, the Wicked Witch of the North, the lovely Nicola, uh, comes out with the most outstanding statements and some are completely daft. But let's look at Uncle Mark Drakesford, uh, the King of Wales. Uh, oh, he's, he's no sex of, symbol, that's for sure. Well, uh, now, of course, the hospital situation is that bad in Wales. And we used to live there. The Welsh are lovely, but the system is, is appalling. And now they've called in the army, army to drive their ambulances. Now, this is, and I challenge that anybody to come against this following statement. This is because you've got autonomy, even NHS Wales. You've made a complete mess of it, like the Scottish school situation, Nicola's made a complete mess of it up there, and the drug situation, which is the highest per capita in Europe. Um, this is what happens when you get the principalities ruling, and they're gonna give them more ruling capacity, Morris. They're gonna give them the ability to make their own laws. I can only see tragedy at a la Catalonia in Spain. Well, look, can I just, um, good. This is what's more frightening than that for the UK. I fear we'll have another lockdown this Christmas, sage scientist calls masks. What, what is this? What is this that England, oh, not England, Boris doesn't think. Even the trade unions are saying, please go into what they call the B plan. Imagine traveling on tubes where people are stuck like this, and each other, no masks are necessary. Where is this coming from? Uh, well, a lot of people are telling us that this is all a matter of control. And uh, the politicians are happy if they get control. Well, uh, same, same control as seatbelts, is it? Uh, well, that's a good point. Uh, other people saying, Yes, let's get rid of seatbelts and put a spike in the middle of the steering wheel. That'll stop people having crashes. Same control as no smoking in certain places, bars, restaurants, planes, supermarkets. And can I it's say... It's nonsense. Well, We've it is. been controlled. Oh, you've raised... Pay your taxes. That's you've, a control. You've raised a very interesting point because a lot of people have an interesting person having a smoke on the terrace because they want to stay outside and not inside. Very sensible. There's lots of air passing on the terraces. Good place to be unless the smokers are there and you're just as likely to die of lung cancer because you're next to a smoker as COVID. Oh, I'm sorry. Smoke is not a virus. And this is the big problem. This is the thing people don't understand. They don't understand why they have to have so many COVID patients in a hospital taking up space for very big emergencies or very important emergencies, especially cancer, and beds are taken up by COVID patients. The answer to that is an interesting one because COVID is a virus. So if you take that patient and don't give him a bed and he walks into a bar, or wherever, or his family, who can spread it. The cancer patient doesn't spread cancer. The cancer patient needs those beds. The cancer patients need the IC units. They need it. Stop being selfish and get vaccinated because vaccination doesn't, this is the idiot anti-vaxxers again. They say, ah, yes, but vaccine doesn't stop you spreading it. The vaccine doesn't stop you getting it. Listen, you idiots, we all know that. But you get it at a lesser extent. It's allowing the hospitals to treat those violently or very dangerously ill people. And all you're being, as the Queen of England says out of her own mouth, you're being selfish. Mm. Stop it. And let's hope they lock you up. In fact, not, not lock down, lock up is the answer I'd like to see. I, uh, well, I, um, you don't often hear this uh, because we oh, no, no, no. agree to disagree on so many things, Morris, but I've got to agree with you. 
um, get 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 some reality and stop spoiling it. You'll give it to somebody eventually, and you'll regret regret it for the rest of your life. No, you'll catch it, and you'll end up like my son did. Now, uh, you know, my son, of course, didn't have the vaccine, not out of choice, but at that time in Spain, it was up to fifty. Uh, from 50 upwards, and he was 45. But thank God, and you know I'm a God believer as you are, thank God these anti-vaxxers weren't around when polio struck. The vaccine has all got rid of polio. Thank God they wasn't around when measles struck. Well, there'd be an awful lot of blind children in the world today. What would they have said if they were around? And you know this thing they said, we don't know what's in it. Or we don't, we don't, we don't, mercury's in it, it's very dangerous. Do you know there's more mercury in a tuna sandwich than there is in the vaccine? This American pop star, rock star, very famous one, Nini Tatiti Tatiti Tatati Tatu, said that she wouldn't take the vaccine because she doesn't know what's in it. So I put it up, the ingredients that are in the vaccine, there's X4623, Ebena, PPT, LK, K over T's, STFP. What do they know? What matters? What's in it? They don't know what it is. No, you're right. I mean, there's too many stars and people without knowledge that are shooting their mouth off. Why should we listen yeah. to these people no, no. just because they can stand on a stage and sing? Yeah, no, but no, there are a lot of, uh, thankfully, celebrities um, who are supporting the vaccine. In fact, I heard yesterday on Breakfast, the British Breakfast, I heard um, Gene Simmons, who is the lead singer for KISS, the one with the black mask and all, uh, really being outspoken against uh, anti-vaxxers. Oh my God, he nearly lost his temper on air. Quite rightly so, quite rightly so. Do you know I've noticed this? I've noticed this. I, if you watch after this, I put up a very interesting, from Australian TV, a very interesting 60 minutes from Australia TV of a woman who calls herself a doctor and I had to admit on air she's not a doctor, who's a leader of anti-vaxxers. One thing I've noticed, and I've noticed on my own Facebook, all anti-vaxxers, once they are confronted with the truth, they walk. There's no debate. They can't debate. And when they debate back what they give you, what they give you is where they're getting their source of information can be debunked in two seconds flat. They say, oh, it's a doctor. Really? Let's look him up. Dr. Hababi. Dr. Hababi. He's a, a North, uh, what are North Eopaths. Because in America, you can be a doctor if you're North Eopath. Uh, indeed. Uh, drill down into the people that are speaking, and more often than not, they're not, they could be doctors of philosophy. Well, that'll help you if you get... Well, well yeah, this, this woman who's, uh, you know, the expert called herself a doctor. In the 60 minutes, I would like you to watch it. She walks off. She said, I can't, I'm not answering that. And she walks. And I put people the challenge on my own page. I've lost nearly every anti-vaxxer off my page. Oh, you're a, you're a hard man, Maurice. I don't know if I'm hard, I'm truthful. I'm not a liar. And I take my sources from people who are highly qualified. Since when, since, Roddy, I'll ask you a question. Since when do you break a leg and go to a florist and ask for some information about fixing your leg? Well, if you died, of course, you'd go to a florist. You'd need that for the funeral. But we'll pass yeah. on to that and we'll go on to COP26. Now, my goodness me, if we use the word hypocrisy, have we got it with COP26? There are 30,000 people flying in building your carbon footprints like I've never been filled before. I've just had a note passed to me saying that the hospitals are no longer uh, accepting uh, registrations for even cancer patients during that time. You can't see a doctor face to face because of all the people that are coming to Glasgow. Oh my goodness me. Um, can you think of anything more stupid than that? Do they not listen or see or view like we are through Zoom? Why isn't that a Zoom conference? And then you can truthfully say, well, you're looking after the climate. No, 30,000 people are coming there. And you know, the police that are needed in there are going to cost 250 million pounds. Morris, it's a joke. Have you seen that these people? 
who are sitting on the roads blocking traffic. You've seen them, of course we have. Look at them carefully. Look at them carefully. They're all middle-class people. Some of them are clergymen, these sort of people, who should have more of a responsibility. The, the, what's needed, I think, that we can see um, there are conferences going on now all over the world. The world is moving forward and recognizing it. Maybe it's been late and starting, but it's recognizing it. I listened to Prince Charles. You know, funny, we used to laugh at Prince Charles. Do you remember talking to the plants and, and caring about the... Well, uh, I don't laugh. I just cry. <laughs> you know, the environment. Prince Philip, the late Prince Philip, was very much a man who believed in the environment and changes in the environment and supporting it. Uh, David Attenborough, of course, as well. Oh, my goodness me, you've raised the ultimate question there, Morris. He's been debunked debunked this week as Uncle David Attenborough, big time, uh, over many scenes that have been shot. The The main scene was the famous one of the seals throwing themselves off a cliff top in either the Arctic or the Antarctic and finishing up on, well, dying, basically. And it's global warming. The glaciers are melting because of global warming. The throne... do, do, excuse me, did we not have global warming a thousand years ago? Well, exactly, but hang on. They sent up a drone. And up the top of the cliff were polar bears chasing after them. That's why they were throwing themselves off the cliff. Look, look, now, I, David I... Attenborough knew that and said nothing. But he might have, he should, but maybe people said he uses as an example. Look. I am certainly, unlike an anti-vaxxer, I don't put myself up as an expert on the environment and therefore I really don't want to discuss too much about it except to say I did see a photograph of two poor polar bears hanging onto an iceberg. But don't they swim? Yes. The iceberg are, are the polar bears. Yeah, well, why, why are they hanging on to that and swim to shore? Well, they're probably tired, Morris, and cold. It's cold up there, you know. Yeah, but they don't get cold. Anyway, look, it's not a subject that I know very much about. I don't know very much about a lot of subjects, but it's not a subject that I know an awful lot about. Okay, uh, well, but, I'll uh, pass on to one that you really know about. Um, and um, this relates to farming today. Now, I know you don't get up early in the morning. <laughs> I know a lot about farming today, yeah, oh, sure. Oh, you will. No, you'll, you'll, you'll know this aspect, because farming today has been going for centuries. And it's been a much respected program until, sorry girls, I know I'm going to be in trouble with you. They woke, the woke BBC stepped in and said, "Eh, we've got to have equal number of men, equal number of women on this Farming Today program. Even though for every one woman, there's probably 50 men in farming because it's a, a strong man's skill. But believe it or not, Seven out of eight of them are now women on this program, and the farmers are not watching it. They're watching the archers because they get more advice, believe it or not, from the archers than farming today. I'll give you an example. I woke up at some unearthly hour the other morning waiting for the Channel 4 uh, Today program on Channel 4, and farming today comes on before that, and it was all about mental health of young people. And they were interviewing all the young people that are saying, oh, we don't like the farming uh, because we're out here on our own and we have to spend a long time alone with sheep and cows and we're we're over the hills. Well, for blooming heck, get yourself a job in McDonald's if you want the the urban lifestyle. Stop going in about your mental health. I'm sorry to tell you, I know very little about farming. Everything I've learned about farming is from a TV program called Jeremy Clarkson's Farm, which is probably the best, best damn program I have ever seen on farming and television. Yes, because it takes, it, it takes it from a man who knows nothing about farming and you watch him learn about it. And I find well, the, the, We're not talking about farming. I've raised the subject as a background. We're talking oh, about everybody saying, oh, we've got to uh, watch the mental health of everybody. I well, tell no, you what, well, Morris, some people are actually saying the following thing. We didn't have any mental health problems in the war because our focus well, was on, quite different. On, look, look, we have social media now, and it's a very big difference than things that during the war. Mental health is an enormous, enormous problem at the moment in the world, but it's not new, but it's now been brought to the surface. 
you know, before you remember, if you were homosexual, you could you wouldn't talk about it until it became sort of legal. I'm not making a comparison. All I'm saying is that mental health, and I've known someone close to me who suffered terribly from a mental health thing. Before it was taboo to talk about mental health. People wouldn't, a rugby player or a football player, someone who seemed or deemed to be macho would never come out and say, I suffer from mental health. But they do, you know, Olympics, uh, Olympic game, Olympic swimmers or divers, and he suffered from a mental problem, Tom Day or whatever his name is. You know, it's, um, it's, it's a really big problem. And I went through, like everybody goes through in life, a black period in my life. I'm just blessed that I didn't suffer. Uh, I've suffered a lot, but not from a mental health problem. A mental health problem is something there's no wound to see. There's no wound to see. There's no bandage to see. And people that you can meet in the street who you think they're perfectly or a friend are perfectly okay. And as soon as they close the door of their house, they go black. They suffer. They cry. So I think it's a huge problem. And I think that it's possibly the best way to deal with that is to talk about it and bring it out to the open. I think that's what we're doing. I don't disagree one, one minute for, uh, about that because, uh, as you say, if you break your leg, people feel sorry for you. If you're depressed, they'll say, pull yourself out of it. Well, of course. And you can't. And, and there is a real it's mental health problem. An I'm talking about the generated mental health problem in the same way that half the nation has got dyslexia. No, they haven't. Some genuine people have. But it's a fashion and it's driven by the media very often. Let's talk okay. about young people's mental health. Well, I'm sorry, in a lot of the cases, it's just generated for the genuine people that have got mental health. They Rodney, deserve Rodney. help. Rodney, you know, I was two things here. My son, who the one who got COVID, Justin, is dyslexic. I'm dyslexic, and one of my grandchildren are dyslexic. We're called, and, and when they analyze it, it's called word blindness. Let me just tell you, you see a word like bad, B-A-D, as D-A-B. You see this dab, you see it. We have three children that are, and we joke with them, Liz Dexic. And we do joke with them and we see it um, in the right perspective. Um, and um, if you look at the IQ of people with dyslexia, it's about 20% higher than the average that, Joe. Well, uh, that's it, just them. It, it yeah, is a condition, but... You've got to put it in perspective. There are ways of helping people without creating the doom and gloom that is created at the moment. It's well, not the end of the world. Uh, I mean, look at you. If you're dyslexic, you've not. I am dyslexic. Of course but, you, you know, are. Look, look, look at, uh, and people make laugh at me all the time with the words that I come up, especially as a broadcaster, I come up with the wrong yes. words. There used to be a program on television when I was a child called The Pickle Factory with Hilda Baker. <laughs> uh, I would probably remember. And she got all her words wrong all the time. And yeah. often when I come off air, my wife or one of my kids said, Dad, you got that so, the word you were looking for, you got it so wrong. But the thing about Justin and the thing about me is we're not ashamed of our dyslexia. Justin, when he used to date and go out when he was a kid of 16, 17, would say to a girl at the menu, look, I can't read. He's, he would, is open about his dyslexia. And that's another thing that I think that's really important that social media does. On the other hand, social media can be very damaging by belittling, saying there's nothing wrong with these people, they don't deserve to be treated properly, or blah, 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 blah. I'm sorry, the social media has a lot to answer for, plus and minus. You know, I wonder if we were better off without the internet than we are now with it. You know, makes, you I, think, makes you think it's a two-edged sword, isn't it? Everything new that happens, yeah, every scientific yeah. discover, discovery has, has yeah. a good and a bad side. Yeah. And uh, i tell you one thing about social media that's been pointed out recently. Um, we have considerable problems, and they reckon more in the future uh, with the Islamic terrorists. Uh, it's happened to a very, very good MP uh, in the last 10 days. Oh. Uh, it, it is well, utterly do wicked. We put that, yeah, do we put that down to, we put it down automatically to his Islamic terrorist because he followed Islam or whatever he was following. But is he not just some bloody nutcase? Uh, well, um, I personally reject the 
blaming always the social media. Oh, well, it's because of social media. There he was in his bedroom uh, and he got infected. That is rubbish. But uh, I don't he, think, got, yeah, he got I don't infected think. because he was brought up uh, in a family and it's been calculated that a great percentage of people in this country, sorry, in the United Kingdom, yeah. uh, have got a real problem. They want Sharia law. Now, Morris, what can you do that when the extremists that want Sharia law keep bombing and they will keep on bombing? And what can we do about it? You know, I think that the media does uh, account for a lot of blame here. And I'll tell you why. Censorship on the, the social media like your Facebook is appalling. Absolutely appalling. What you can put on Facebook or, or any of these outlets without censorship, which can drive kids to do some terrible things, I think. And he's been confronted with it all the time. And he just seems money over matter. It just seems to be un, uh, unimportant to him. And honestly, um, I'm talking about Zuberger. I think that uh, that uh, as clever as he is, and, and applaud him for his successes, does he really need to have all these extremists on Facebook? He said that they're trying to tackle the problem. Um, let me just give you a quick a, a quick story. I had a phone call once when I was in work, and the girl came in to me and he said, "You've got a call in Spanish. Do you want me to come and translate?" I said, "Yes, please." And it was for the, from the security police of Spain. So I said to her, this is a wind-up. Why would the security police of Spain call me? I'm not a secu- I don't think I'm a security threat. Uh, anyway, she said, yes, he says he is, and he'd like to meet you. So I was a bit nervous about this. And I said, OK, I'll meet him in El Corte Inglés uh, restaurant at 10 o'clock on Wednesday morning, say. So I went with Wendy, who speaks fluent Spanish, and we sat there at 10 o'clock, five past 10, 10. And I said, there you are, Wendy. I told her, it's all nonsense. Wind up. Next minute, a guy walks in a pair of jeans he had on. He had a plaid shirt on. And he looked at me and sort of nodded. And I nodded back. And he came over, took out the real badge, but the heavy badge, and showed it to me, please. Sat down, spoke with Wendy, took out a little black book, and he started asking questions. So Wendy said, he wants to know why you spoke to Ananjam Chowdhury on May last year at 8.15 in the evening. What was the conversation about Anjam Chowdhury? He's the Islamic fundamentalist uh, preacher in London who's in prison. I think he's in prison now again, who, uh, who applauds the person who beheaded that soldier, who stands when all the soldiers' bodies come back with his mates and clap and applaud. Anjam Chowdhury is responsible for all that. But Anjam Chowdhury has been on my show many times, so I can confront him. No good sweeping this sort of stuff under a carpet. So Wendy said to the policeman, the, the security policeman, my husband was speaking to him as a guest on his radio show. And the policeman closed the little black book and said, what radio show? So we explained everything. He said, oh, I'm really sorry to have disturbed you. We, we didn't realize it was radio. We just got notified of a call coming in from Anjam Chowdhury or from Spain to Anjam Chowdhury because they've got triggers that trigger off a lot of these um, uh, terrorists from making calls. The police will pick up immediately, it'll turn a red light on or a trigger on. And that's exactly what happened. So I applaud the police. I think they do a damn good job trying to keep us safe in possibility, but they try to keep us safe. And I think they do a pretty good job. They do, sh- and um, there have been many serious attempts, one in Spain that would have caused tragedy this last week. They stopped that just in time. Now, what is the answer, Maurice? Do you let these people, obviously in Britain, they're free. They're putting out poison in their mosques. A lot of people are saying, well, what is this about? Well, I, you know, with that, this thing about the mosque, first of all, just go back to the, to the liar Trump. Uh, was he right in stopping Muslims coming into America? It was the biggest racist thing that I've ever seen in my life. Would, would it be Jews next or Christians next? Um, he, he would not uh, agree with that statement. He did not. Okay, so, so then would you agree with Boris stopping Muslims coming into Great Britain? Uh, I, 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 it doesn't affect me what race religions there are, but if they're illegal immigrants, 
Now, I think so I'm not talking about no, he was illegal. He wasn't, Trump wasn't then talking about They should illegal. not be coming into Britain. Simple as no. that. Yeah, Trump didn't speak about illegals. He just said Muslims can't come in. Now, let, let me just say you can't blame everyone for a tiny minority of what's going on. The problem is, how many people does it take to set a bomb? One. Um, yeah, there's always some beha somebody behind it, Morris. It's not okay, two. Long. Look, this is a subject that is, is, is open-ended because, first of all, you and me are not certainly experienced enough to be able to put our finger on it, but we can discuss it, of course. It's a frightening thing. What have we learned from the past? What have we learned from Nazi Germany? What have we learned from slaughter when someone can walk into a Manchester arena when there's a young girl singing full of teenagers and blow them to smithereens? What is what has we learned that uh, some people accept that's what God wants? What have we learned from that? We've learned nothing, zero, zero. The only thing that we can hope is that the security forces can protect as best they can. That's all we can do. I mean, the people flying in today, uh, could, uh, there's someone in an apartment making a homemade bomb. They meet up together. They go to Porto Venus and blow everyone up. You know, it's... Uh, but, but the thing that annoys me, Rodney, about this is when you see someone who's done the most horrendous thing like that boy did to the uh, Ali something Ali, who did to the minister last week, he, they say he's been on the watch. They've been watching him. Well, they certainly haven't been watching him good enough, have they? No, indeed. Morris, time has overtaken us. I'm going to ask okay. you one conundrum before we go. Uh, and it's a bit sad, this, and it relates to UK. I've had a number of people chatting to me this week that things have changed in UK. And I say, well, it changed everywhere. The pandemic has brought the good and the bad out of people. Um, what do you mean? Uh, they've changed. Um, one person says, well, when I go into um, a pub for an evening meal, I don't get treated with the same courtesy. I am regimented. Uh, it is not kindness that's being showed any longer. It's take it or leave it. I've even had an estate agent um, tell me this yeah. last week, haven't, haven't things changed? I said, well, what do you mean? Well, People, it's a stressful time when you're selling, it's selling and buying a house. Uh, but the average person now has got no patience. They're finding things wrong with the house they're buying or the seller doesn't want to do this. And people are getting really nasty. Now, I don't find that in Portugal and Spain. And indeed, other people don't find it in other countries. Why is it happening in England? Why are there notices in the NHS Doctor surgeries, ferry companies saying, we will not tolerate bad language and abuse to our members of staff. Wow. But, but look, you know, in, in outpay, what do you call emergencies in the hospital? What's the, the area that the, you go in at night if you're, if you're in, in the hospital? When you go in at night, if you're in an accident, what do you call that? Emergency, emergency or whatever it's called, the unit that you go into, you're brought by Any. ambulance. Yeah, okay. You know, my, my nephew is a doctor and, and trained there. My father was a doctor and trained there. Do you know how much violence is put up against these doctors in there? With no, you know, when I was a kid, the name doctor bred the word respect. If you used to phone up and used to say, this is Dr. Boland, just certainly would fetch you a table. If you're a policeman, when I was a kid, there was great respect. I remember we were allowed to play on the street we go across the road to see our friends. But when a policeman came walking down the street, Mr. Plot, we'd be frightened. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. But nowadays, I watched a program of inner city violence uh, on a Saturday night, drunks, weighing up against the van of a police van with the police in it looking at him. You get a kid who comes home and says to his daddy, Daddy, the teacher hit me or I was made stay in after class. <clears throat> you know, I would never have said that to my father. I would have been sent to my room. Disgraced. Right. Nowadays, the father goes and beats the teacher up. What sort of society are we bringing up? Okay, well, come on, let's have a remedy. Have you got one? Education, respect. 
Watch what you're putting out on television and on social media that kids are watching. You know, I had my grandson staying with me last night. He's 10 and he loves to perform. He's taken after his grandpa and his father, I think. He's in the rock school in San Pedro. He's 10, he's drumming, uh, an amazing kid. But when I get up, he's listening to this rap music, which is all the F words and this words. And then I said, Jaden, please, I don't want you to listen to that. Put on Cliff Richard. <laughs> <laughs> Bit of a drastic step that, Morris. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, you know, it's, it's what kids are watching. It's what they're learning. They watch nothing but violence all the time. And these kids in the inner city, they grow up thinking this is a way of life. The hood, whatever you like to call it. Every film that comes out almost on Amazon or, or Netflix is violent. When I was a kid, and you were, well, you were a kid before the First World War, but when I was a kid, we used to watch Roy Rogers or Tonto. There's or a lot, lot about at the moment, isn't there? The Lone Ranger. No, the Tonto bit, I mean. No, the Lone Ranger. And I remember going to the cinema for 10p on a Sunday. I was allowed to in the afternoon, this was because the cinema was around the corner of my house. And we would gallop down the streets as if we were on horses banging our bottoms. And that was the most violent thing we ever got up to. So, so you look at the films today. My God. Yeah. Well, it look pays to be Jewish then, doesn't it? If you can watch the yeah. cinema on a Sunday. Yeah, but look, I tell you something. What's that? I don't know what it's going to do. But you, you said parental control. Really? After nine o'clock, kids aren't meant to be watching this. After nine o'clock? You tell me a kid of 10 who's in bed by nine o'clock. It's all nonsense. It's violent. That's what's selling. There's a program on television at the moment. It's a series. I wouldn't let my grandson watch it because it goes out at 10 in the evening. It's called Something Black. I can't remember what it is. Brilliant series. Scary as hell about violence in the home. So they say this is very important to bring to the fore about violence at home. Well, we know about violence at home. We know about it. Uh, didn't they change the drink laws in England so you can drink all night now that they don't have to close the bars at any certain time? Why? They couldn't control the inner cities at night and the weekends. Why did they make it even longer? Their argument is if we have closing times at 12, they'll drink three times as much because they know they're closing at 12. <laughs> you tell that to a teenager. Oh, here, I only have one drink now. You can drink all night. I have, you have three. There's something wrong, you know, with society at the moment. And, and um, we're all to blame, all of us to blame. You know, none of us are, are going to escape from responsibility of what's happening. Okay, we can't go without cheering the viewer up. We've had some delightful weather over here in the in southern Spain. Oh yes, fantastic! Uh, it's been a long time since it um, it rained properly. Uh, rained last night, by the way. But I didn't hear. I'd listen. We're no, over no, around hear. the corner from you. It didn't rain. It, it did, honestly. I, I came Obviously, out. Came it rains out on the righteous and not on the unrighteous. No, it rains on both, doesn't it? So that's covered yeah. us both. Yeah, but I mean, I just I came out and I saw some puddles on the terrace, and I said, "What?" And then you went out and saw the car was wet and it was you know had rain on us. So yeah, and the negative side of all this sunshine, of course, because it's not complete paradise. Is we're very close to the Sahara, and when it rains a little bit with big spots. Uh, the car cleaning and the oh, amount yeah. of sand on the car is unbelievable. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, even today, I noticed, for example, I've lived here for a long time. Um, and I, I noticed when I'm having lunch in this restaurant, we're having on the terrace. I won't go indoors even now with COVID. I don't eat on a terrace. Then when the terrace, I had to call the waiter over to put the umbrella over. So I thought I, when I was like 30, I, I was sun worshipping. I loved being in the sun and now, nowadays, you worry about everything that the sun can do uh, and, uh, against you. So I had to have the um, and Next, I'll be walking on the street with an umbrella in the sun. My God. How'd you get your vitamin D, Morris? Here, oh, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here I, we I don't go. think I should have asked oh, that. Oh, my goodness me. Are we being sponsored by this company? I must ring them. Uh, we'll put it away then, if we're not. Vitamin the D3. In the world. And I'm how many that. units of that do you take a day? This is 4,000 units. 
My so I, I take one every two days. Right, okay. So 2,000 units a day or, yeah. uh, on average. Yeah. Well, I, and I take it only because I was told it's uh, pretty good at the COVID thing. And so, uh, it, but, it's no bad thing. And good for your bones, I understand. We'll leave it there, Maurice, with you in the, at the height of your fitness and looking suave. Oh, and, take, your, take your vitamin D. Get yourself vaccinated and listen to this television show. Well, he means view, but we'll settle for that. Thank you, Maurice Boland. Peace and love. What did Ringo? Love and peace. Love and peace. Love and peace. Yeah, oh, sorry, just before you go, remember that great documentary is coming out, the Beatles documentary, next month. You know, 50 hours of film they found that's never been seen before. And one of the top directors in, in Hollywood has made a documentary in two parts. It's going to, they, I've seen the trailer for it. And I must tell you that it looks like it was filmed the way with technology today, the sharpness of the color and everything of the Beatles of John, George, Paul and Ringo. Unbelievable. And showed how they worked closely together. Even when they were rang, they cooperated in everything, which I think I'm a big Beatle fan. So I'm yeah, really looking. I think we both are. Thank you so much. I salute you. <laughs>